Cha-cha-cha-cha-cha! Hello everyone, it's me, Jurassic Park! Let's learn to save Jurassic World! Together, let's go! Hold on, hold on people, stop the Jeep ride, just stop it! Yo, John Williams, cut the music! Steven Spielberg, you should know better. If I'd made this mistake, the internet would be running me out of town on a rail. Come on, Stevie! The Triceratops, Velociraptor, and T-Rex aren't from the Jurassic period, meaning that the park should be called Cretaceous World. Cretaceous Park, Cretaceous World. Hey, no one said scientific accuracy was catchy. <laughs> Internet, welcome to Film Theory. Hello, Internet, welcome to Film Theory. Hello. Three founding members of the Chris Pratt Appreciation Club. I mean, seriously, <laughs> this guy can do no wrong in my eyes. Well, except for maybe passengers. Yeah, and for totally causing the universe to get dusted. But seriously, this guy is my perpetual man crush Monday. Attention, all you internet shippers. Here's the new hashtag, hashtag Pratt Pat. Oh. A.K.A. Mario! It's to me, Mario! <laughs> so of course, as Chris Pratt's biggest, totally not creepy, totally not a stalker fan, you know that I'm excited about the new Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. I mean, what is not to love about a Six Flags full of dinosaurs? Yeah, sure, but that was just growing pains. Jurassic World opened to the public and had... Okay, fine, fine. Filling a park with bloodthirsty prehistoric beasts may not be the safest choice. Which begs the question then, is a dino park really doomed for failure, multiple casualties, and more lawsuits than you can shake a shirtless Jeff Goldblum at? And the answer is a decided no. For as difficult as it might seem to run a park like this, all of it, and I do mean all of it, could have been easily avoided if the people running the park had just done some basic research. Basic research and have proper appropriate management skills. Of all the problems of a major theme park and a major zoo. Right, you are, two eyed Nick Fury. The Jurassic Parks do, in fact, have all the problems of a mega sized zoo coupled with the danger factor of an amusement park. But after studying all of the Jurassic Park films, yes, even Jurassic Park 3, I've come to the conclusion that three simple fixes could have completely reversed the course of all of these movies, resulting in hundreds of lives saved. Interesting. So let's learn about it more together and also a few billion less at the box office. But who's counting? So get ready! Today we're learning how Jurassic World should protect when dinos attack. First, we have to talk space. Now, this should come as no surprise, but wild animals need space and captivity to thrive. If an animal is kept in an enclosure that's too small, well, things are gonna start to get a little hairy. Or, I suppose if you're keeping a dinosaur scaly? Feathery? At this point? Is, is it feathery now? Is it feathery now? Anyway, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, created a manual with the basic tenets of how to treat animals in confinement. Per the manual, there are strict minimums for the amount of space needed for each species based on their size. For for example, a lion needs a minimum of 10,000 square feet, a little over the size of a baseball diamond's infield or five tennis courts. If that sounds like a lot, well, consider this. In the wild, a typical lion's territory is 100 square miles. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. That's Lion King! Nearly 300,000 times more than what's being given to them in captivity. But okay, if this is the standard for keeping animals happy in captivity in a humane way, we can apply similar metrics to a dinosaur, and thus approximate the minimum amount of space needed to keep these ancient creatures in check. Approximate estimate. So the biggest lions are about 4 foot by 8 foot in size, meaning that for every 32 square feet a lion, he needs 10,000 square feet to roam freely. Per scientists, the average T-Rex was just a wee bit bigger, at 18 <laughs> feet by 40 feet. So for the 720 square feet that a T-Rex covers, he's gonna need 32 over 10,000 equals 720 over X, a minimum of 225,000. 
1,000 square feet to thrive. That is nearly five acres of land for one thunder lizard. To put it in jock terms, that is four and a half football fields for one animal. So how well does Jurassic World do when it comes to giving its star attractions the appropriate amount of space? Well, we never actually see the full-sized pen for the T-Rex, but we uh -huh. do get to see it for his genetic mutant brother, the Irex. Uh, correction, we kinda get to see it. You see, the movie can't really decide if the Irex paddock is a hexagon or an octagon. Uh, maybe oh. they should have spent less time focused on the height of the walls. Oh, oh. But okay, we can do some quick calculations to figure this thing out. First, based on this exterior shot of the paddock being reinforced, we can see that it's shockingly small actually. We just heard that the walls are 40 feet high, so by using pixel measurements, we can calculate that this side of the paddock is a little less than 100 feet long, and the whole thing is shaped like a regular octagon, so it's not gonna be that big. That seems absurdly small, so let's double check those numbers. At 35 minutes, 12 seconds into the movie, you can see that they're at a bend in the paddock, with the scratches on the adjacent wall. 30 seconds later, we see Owen enter the paddock with the claw marks directly across from the team. Since the overhead map shows us that the shape of the paddock is a regular octagon that would mean uh -huh. that they're entering here and walking across to here what so let's try with it with a uh, six sided let's try eight sided instead of six sided to give them more of a benefit right once they get the call to evacuate, it takes my Pratty Pie eight seconds to sprint towards the exit, only to then be cut off at the halfway point by the Irex. They turn around, running for their lives, sprinting at top speed, except apparently taking a bit more leisurely of a jog this time, since now it takes exactly 29 seconds for Owen to get to the door that he just ran away from eight seconds prior. Man! It's almost as if between the Jurassic name, the inconsistent paddock shape, and now Chris Pratt's variable running speed, it's almost like the movie doesn't care if it gets the details right. Nah, that could be it. Anyway, the top sprint speed for an average human is 16 miles per hour. Though, Chris Pratt, you'll never be average to me. Meaning that the total length they'd be running from entrance to exit is about 90 feet once you factor in the octagonal shape, getting cut off at the halfway point, etc, etc. Anyway, long story short, the shockingly small dimensions of the Irex paddock unbelievably check out. So with wall lengths of 100 feet, the area of the pen winds up being 48,284 square feet. That might seem big, but we must recognize that is from our human scale. For the, uh, for the big animal, that is super small. That is the size of one football field minus the end zones. It is one-fifth the recommended size for a creature that large. Even if you were to double the size of the paddock as it currently stands, you would still be at less than half of what this creature needs to be kept humanely. There's even an in-universe explanation for why this pen would be so incredibly tiny. NASA containment insisted we build the walls up higher. It's bigger than expected. So they adjusted the height of the walls to accommodate it being bigger, but they didn't actually adjust the size of the paddock. It's no oh. wonder the Indominus Rex was scratching up the walls going crazy. It was living in the dino equivalent of a tiny house. And it's Goodness. not just the size of the enclosure that matters, but also the design within that enclosure. Again, per the AZA manual, quote, careful consideration should be given to exhibit design so that all areas meet the physical, social, behavioral, and psychological needs of the species. Animals should be displayed whenever possible in exhibits replicating their wild habitat. End quote. Basically, what it's saying is the best way to keep an animal happy in confinement is to trick it into believing it's not actually in confinement. Go figure. Big surprise. But yet again, Jurassic surprise. World fails to meet these absolutely basic standards. Fell! Absolute fell! <laughs> The aquatic Mosasaurus is kept in a huge, deep tank that spectators watch from underground. There's only one problem with that, though. Per historical record, the Mosasaurus was actually more comfortable in shallower waters. Putting it uh -huh. in a deep water tank is the exact opposite of what this animal needs. But the oversight that really comes back to bite them, in a very literal sense, is with the raptors. You see, raptors. we always visualize dinosaurs roaming around in dense tropical forests, and for the most part, that's largely true. 
For example, the majority of all T-Rex fossils were found in North America, the most famous being in the Hell Creek Formation in the Wyoming, Montana area. Now, Montana might seem like a far cry from a tropical paradise, but remember, we're talking about billions of years ago. North America back then was thought to be fairly hot and humid during the Cretaceous period. So putting a dino theme park on a tropical island like Isla Nublar, which, according to the movies, is 120 miles west of Costa Rica with an average temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 80% humidity, well, it's a pretty darn good choice for the T-Rex. In fact, it's a good choice for most of the dinosaurs, except for the Velociraptors. You see, raptor fossils were found closer to Mongolia. This area was much more dry and arid during the Cretaceous period. For the oh. raptors to feel comfortable in a tropical environment like Isla Nublar, they would need to be placed in the equivalent of a zoo's desert exhibit. But looking at the raptor enclosures, Jurassic World has made zero attempts at recreating their natural environments. Imagine putting a polar bear in a jungle. It would be completely crazy. Unless, of course, you were in some sort of tropical island post-death purgatory state. It's a polar bear. And yet, that's pretty much exactly what these so-called geniuses at Jurassic World are doing. So, how do you solve a problem like a raptor? Well, how do you solve a problem like a raptor? You train them. The AZA manual recommends using what's known as operant conditioning, where behaviors are encouraged operates condition are discouraged through rewards and punishments. For example, rats were put in a cage with two buttons, green and red. If rats pressed the green button, they got food, but if- Okay, so interesting. There's something called operational the conditioning. The more you know. They pressed the red one, they received a mild electric shock. Worst experiment for them ever. Through this type of positive and negative conditioning, the rats learned to only press the green button for food. Real world zoo and aquarium employees use similar tactics to teach animals how to behave, reducing the potential for any sorts of conflict. And it would seem like this is exactly what Owen is doing with the raptors. Owen uses a clicker to control them. If the dinosaurs respond to Owen's click, they're rewarded with food, in essence training them through positive operant conditioning. Oh, Chris, you're such a clever girl. <laughs> but apparently not clever enough. Sorry, Chris, I what? still stan you. Hashtag Pratt Pat forever. But I'm telling you this because I don't want you to become a dino's Monty Chris. Ooh, God, that was bad for even me. You see, you keep pushing the clicker. You, you did know that this movie was made with a lot of CGI, right? push it repeatedly to get the raptor's attention. According to zoologists who actually use this technique, all you're gonna do is just confuse the animals. One click, one reward. If you want to get the animals to respond with special enthusiasm for an action, you should increase the rewards associated with a single click, like giving it more food. You don't increase the number of clicks. More clicks only dilute the positive reinforcement you've already conditioned the animal for, which honestly is gonna explain why Owen's control over the raptors doesn't always work that way. Well. Oh. Looks like someone needs to get better at click baiting. Oh! Wow. <laughs> That's good, actually. That's good. Get good at click baiting. <laughs> That's funny, that's funny, that's I gotta funny. say I'm proud of that one. Now, obviously, all this seems like a lot to fix. Train dinosaurs to respond to positive and- Dead jokes! Negative stimuli, increase their living space, and design each habitat for each dino's individual needs. But there's already a real-world counterpart that's done exactly these things. Well, without the dinosaurs, that is. The Kilimanjaro Safari at Disney's Animal Kingdom. It's actually kinda crazy the amount of work that went into this tour. Animals wow. are set loose and allowed to quote unquote roam free in open spaces designed for each species. But it's all a magic trick. It's all an illusion. Hidden moats and rock formations sprinkled throughout the park separate carnivorous animals from their potential prey, which includes oh. humans, keeping the animals in check while still keeping them happy and on display. The rocks where the lions hang out, totally air condition. Seriously, there are air conditioning blowers built into these things. And if it gets cold, they have heaters built in too, which encourages the lions to hang out in plain view. To encourage the animals to be more active, Disney installed concrete feeders hidden as elements in the environment, like broken tree limbs and rocks. And as far as operant conditioning is concerned, at the end of every day, each animal has been specially trained to respond to different sounds. The crocodiles have a metal bar that's being hit underwater, elephants come in to the beat of a drum, giraffes listen for a cowbell, 
and a duck call is used for the gazelles. It's the perfect example for Jurassic World to follow. Isla Nublar is a whopping 30 square miles in size, so there is plenty of room. Owen gets good as a trainer, they add in some controlled climates, easy as that, no deaths, no lawsuits. Long story short, if you find yourself buying a zoo of any type, prehistoric or otherwise, just learn how the animals behave. It'll save a lot of lives. Or, I don't know, you could just sell the whole thing to Disney. But something tells me that Universal ain't gonna be doing that anytime soon. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And if you want more delicious dino action, well then check out my collaboration with one of my all-time favorite people on YouTube, Rosanna Pancino. In honor of the new Jurassic World, we got together to bake a dinosaur fossil cake. Not only did I have a blast nerding out with her over dino things, the cake is, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the single best chocolate cake that I have ever tasted. I mean, it's no thanks to me. I was literally no help at all. But seriously, and I'm not just saying this because I like Rosanna or anything, her crew literally had to stop me from eating this thing when the cameras were rolling. It was incredible. So if you're in the mood for some incredible desserts, or just me acting like an idiot in the kitchen, hammer the box to the left, or otherwise chomp down on my Jurassic World conspiracy theory video, The Box to the Right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to leave that Chris Pratt is at his favorite cafe right now. Mad Pat's coming for you, Chrissy. Yeah! <laughs> oh, thank you so much for watching this video. That was very cute and adorable to watch. Thank you so much. I hope that you find yourself uh, enjoying this, uh, enjoy watching this video together with me. If you do like this video, please remember to <gasps> like, share, and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have anything to share about us. Don't forget to follow my channel and sincerely appreciate all of the support and encouragement for my work. Thank you so much. It's very uplifting. Uplifting and motivating. Yeah, I hope that this video has been very educational and I hope that you learn something new. Very knowledgeable and wide um, wisdom field. Thank you so much. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Yay! And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Subscribe. Thank you.